Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 29, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I really, really mean it. In fact, the reason I'm a little late is the slide just kept growing and growing and growing, and I realized that I might not be able to cover everything this week, so it may carry over into the next week and then weeks afterwards. Anyway, I think uh, now you know what I need to do in order to cover everything. Let's go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. The makers of Mountain Dew, which is PepsiCo, do not compensate me for this free endorsement. But if anyone else out there has a, or PepsiCo, hey, give me a shout out. Equally caffeinated and delicious drink. That's good stuff. I'm going to be on this market like a spider monkey. You wait and see. All right. Hey, guess what? I keep begging for a sponsor. We got one. Yay! I'm going to tell all my friends. Today's Week in Charts is brought to you by Financial Juice. www.financialjuice.com slash Dave Landry if you want to follow, follow me there. Um, good stuff. It's, um, it's a neat website. At first, it appears to be a little news-based, and you're probably thinking, well, hey, Dave, I thought you ignored the news. Well, I do ignore the news. But I was speaking with the owner just yesterday, and we were talking, and it's really uh, financial content social media, kind of a social media network for the financial world. So it's, it's a really cool thing that they got going on over there. So check it out, and uh, make sure you follow me there when you get there, financialjuice.com slash Dave Landry. All right, uh, there's a disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up real quick because we got a lot to do. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. You read the book? You like the book? Throw me a bone on Amazon.com. Uh, we do have some new developments with the book. I'm, I can't, I'm not at liberty to announce just yet, but uh, some exciting things I think are happening there. But uh, if the reason I beg for review, other than the obvious, to, to make me look good, is that... Um, there are some malignant people out there that review their reviews. And then you get a review or two that's like, uh, oh, it's a lot of work. Well, yeah, it's a lot of work, but, you know, it's like, is, is it work a lot of work? Is it whatever your profession is a lot of work? So anyway, throw me a bone if you get a chance. All right, we're going to talk about this week. Uh, we have a new, a new dead money report, which is uh, very exciting. That's uh, one of my favorite topics. It means that I'm doing a good job. If I have a dead money report, um, support resistance once broken. I'm going to touch upon this this week. It looks like we're running out of time, based on the amount of time it's going to require for the setting stops. I started working on my slides around 5:30, about 5:30 this morning, and uh, they just kept growing and growing and growing. And I realized that uh, this is a topic that could probably be a, a an entire seminar in and of itself. So. We'll see what we can get through on that, and I will touch upon that uh, support resistance once broken. Uh, anything you want covered, uh, start thinking about that now. Uh, again, we got a full plate today, so we might not be able to get to it, but it certainly could become fodder for uh, another show. And if you don't mind, uh, do the do the do the Q and A. Um, if you have any questions, uh, keep them relative to the slides, at least for now. And then once we get to the live charts, uh, ask about one stock at a time. In fact, let's scratch this out. You can ask any question you want. Um, but once we get to the stocks, and uh, just ask about one stock at a time. So hold off on your stock questions just yet, uh, or so, I should say on individual issues just yet. We'll get to those towards the end of the show. Um, this should be uh, obviously a 29 up here. So let's scratch through this. 29. Okay. All right, this week's Dead Money Report is brought to you by TreadFollowingMoron.com. Okay? Uh, Investopedia defines dead money as a slang term for money invested in security with minor hopes of appreciation or earning a return. Well, that's all fine and dandy, except that there's no way of knowing whether or not a position will eventually work. Now, obviously you have to use a stop 
but there's no way of knowing ahead of time whether or not it's going to be dead money or not. If you knew that, that's one of those crystal ball, holy grail type of things. And trust me, no one knows, not even Big Dave. Okay? So let's take a look at this NVRO. This is a new issue. It pulls back. It triggers right here. It looks like it's off to the races. First day in. And I'm pretty darn excited, okay? But then what happens? Just starts trading sideways. And doesn't do much of anything. But where was that stop on this one? Uh, I think it was about six points away or so, if memory serves. So it didn't get stopped out. We may have bumped it a little bit there. And it didn't get stopped out. So what do you do? Well, you sit on your hands. That's what you do. And you wait. And then look what happened here. This is beautiful. It gapped open. Someone's saying that they can't hear me. Um, check, reboot your PC. Well, you can't hear me, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, um, the problem is it's a lot of things can happen between me and you. Like I often say, maybe a squirrel's moving his nuts from one location to another, and he's got a couple of, couple of his nuts caught in the wires or something. But anyway, we had a nice uh, opening gap reversal. Thank you for the confirmation on sound. Uh, nice opening gap, not reverse, but opening gap here. We see it, it did run up a little bit. It didn't kind of close flat on the day. But based around the gap uh, area, you can see that you got a pretty nice trade out of that. In fact, you're looking for 1% on 100K for the first loaf, which is equal to $1,000. And you got... One three five seven. So you you, you made thirty five percent more, or thirty six percent more, I guess round numbers, than you intended. And that's a good thing. Every now and then you have that surprise in the direction of the trend. Now every now and then you're going to get whacked. That I can guarantee. But I often preach that surprises happen in the direction of the trend. And I think I borrowed that line from Jeff Cooper way back in the uh, trading markets days when I used to help him out with his. Uh, his uh, advisory service or his uh, trading service way back then. And that's something that he used to, um, I, I noticed in his writings, he often said. So surprises often happen in the direction of the trend. So that's one thing that works in our favor. Not always. There's nothing always in trade, okay? But as you can see, so far, so good. About a 10-point run, which is about 30%. It's not bad. And the other thing to look at, too, is, okay, when you're dealing with a dead money position, just let it go. Try to forget about it. Try to think about it too much. But if you look at the returns on this from there to there, which is 25%, and this amount of time, okay, and you annualize that out, that's close to 300%. Okay? So that's awesome. That means that your account grew really fast over a short period of time. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes it takes time. In fact, I was telling a couple of clients recently, especially since you take a look at like the Rusty, which is probably a good benchmark for us. And this is what the Rusty looked look like over the last year, pretty much, pretty much like that. Okay, and that's pretty much what we did. Okay, we didn't we didn't knock the cover off the ball. Uh, we barely kept our head above the water during that period. But as I get older and older. I've become more and more patient, and I've wrapped my head around the fact that when you're trading momentum, you have to chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it, and then, bam, you get something like this NVRO that takes off. And then maybe you'll get two or three or four of those. And one of them may really go up big, and it makes your whole year. And that's the whole thing. Unfortunately, sometimes it might take a year for these stocks to come along and in the meantime you kind of grind it out now as long as you keep your risk in line and you keep risking two percent and you leave that other side open okay so your maximum risk barring overnight gaps of course is two percent and your maximum upside is unlimited okay so if you get one that moves 20% total on the total portfolio, okay, now 
for instance, this would only be, let's see, that's 1,400, and that's, uh, what's that? What, what's, what are those two numbers together? Let's just do it. Let's just say those, that's $3,000 round number to make it easy. So that's 3% of your portfolio. But let's say the stock continues to run in here, and it becomes like 20% of the entire portfolio. So let's say you make 20% overall on the position. Well, that turns into a 10-time reward. Now, go in and watch. I don't know if it's up on YouTube. Maybe I'll be generous enough and upload it to YouTube. Somebody remind me. I did, I think I did two presentations in a row on this. Somebody was really having a problem wrapping their head around or they, they had a, a very, um, what's a good word, lively debate or they weren't, they couldn't quite understand how the risk to reward could work and I call it R versus R and I did a few presentations on that so if you have the flash drives they're on the flash drives if you don't um, please uh, email me to remind me I'll be happy to put it up on YouTube for you and make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel while you're there and for now until I change my mind but as long as everybody seems to appreciate it I'm gonna continue to put these weekend charts up there for a while I'll still sell the flash drives, which makes it a lot more convenient. Uh, but if you go to, I'm sorry, scratch that out. www.youtube. www.youtube.com slash C as in Charlie, which means custom slash Dave Landry. Okay, and subscribe there. They're not going to spam you anything. It just when you go to YouTube, you'll be able to see what's going on on my YouTube channel. So um, I don't know if the presentation is up there yet, but if it's not, I'll put it up. But I did a big, like I said, two or three weeks where I did R versus R, and that's risk versus reward. And I think I did a pretty good job of building my case for that. Now, keep in mind, it's not my way or highway. If you don't fully agree, that's fine. As long as you're successful in what you're doing, don't let me mess you up. But if you could, if you could say, you know, this does make some sense, and uh, I should say this, not a question mark. This does make some sense, so I could use that in my by trading. Then, then by all means, do it. Now, ironically, and then I realized after, like I said a few minutes ago, since I've been working on this since five thirty this morning, and I'm still not done. I realized that this might not be. This is obviously not something we can cover in just a few minutes. But I think I can cover enough of it to give you a pretty pretty good feel for for what's going on, especially once I um, once I wrap it up a little bit. Now, when it comes to trading, there's a lot of there's an art and there's a science. I, I'm I'm um, was just I just recently joined um, uh, Tom McClellan's uh, group. And his is like the, he's got a forum called The Art of Technical Analysis. And I told Tom, I said, well, Tom, if you, if you notice, if you go to um, The Art of the Charts is, is my uh, website. And, and I asked Tom about the use of the word art. He says, well, he just wants to make it clear to everyone that it is an art. And the beauty is it's an art that can be learned. And I'm going to. If, if time allows, I'm going to explain that in a lot more detail. But for the for the time being, let's talk about a few things you need to ask yourself when going in to a position. The first thing is, how long do you plan on? How long do you want to be in a position? Okay. So the answer to that that I always give is ten years. Okay, well, no, 20 years. I want to be in a position 20 years. If I buy a stock today, I want to be in that stock 20 years from now. Okay, unfortunately, the money management takes me out much longer. I'm sorry, uh, much sooner. Okay, now, when we get to the next slide, the longer you want to be in that position, as your time horizon goes out, the bigger the stop has to be because the more that market can move over that given period 
of time. Now, but Dave, you want to be in it 20 years. How do you have a stop that will keep you in that stock for 20 years? Wouldn't your stop have to be way down here off the screen somewhere for a stock to straighten up here? And the answer is yes. But what I do without digressing too far is I look to trade a swing trade out and hopefully get to that initial profit target. Okay, so my time horizon is just this big. Okay, and if I get that 20 years, if this is 20 years, then my time horizon is this big. So I need to try to survive a move this big. And if I survive a move that big, then maybe, just maybe, the position has moved enough in my favor so I can begin to loosen up my stop. So let's say I get in, and then I hit that initial profit target up here. So my initial stop, which may have been look like this, I can now begin to slowly widen out to look more. My initial stop, which looked like this, I can slowly begin to widen out to look a little bit more like that. Now, I'm not increasing my risk, per se, because, one, I'm scaling out. Pin's not working great today. I'm scaling out meaning I'm taking partial profits, and two, I am I'm playing with the market's money. Now, I hate that word. I hate that phrase. But what I'm doing is, let's say a position goes up 3.5 points in my favor. Well, I might raise the stop 2.5 points, okay? So effectively, I just opened up that stock stop STOP by one point. So... Again, this comes back to another presentation, but I did uh, quite a few presentations, and again, they're on the flash drives. I don't know how many are on YouTube, but I did a presentation or two where I talk about changing hats from being a swing trader to a longer-term trader. So for all intents and purposes with my system, okay, all I have to worry about is the next week or so. Okay, so I want to be able to survive at least the next week or so, and hopefully that week will turn into months and years. And let's go back to our little dead money example, okay? In this particular case, stops down here somewhere. I wanted to be able to survive a one-week move, and I actually survived one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, about almost a month. And then the stock took off, okay? So now what I'm doing is I've got the stop that looked like this. Well, now I'm beginning to wind it out a little bit, and it's beginning to look more like that. So hopefully, and hopefully it will go up first, and I'll get the stop even wider. I'll be able to ride out some pretty serious corrections. Um, kite is a good example. It required a little discretion, but it came down and sort of nicked the stop and came back up. So we knew that the stock took off. We widen that stop out in an attempt to uh, ride out a longer-term correction. So without discretion, which I don't want to get too sidetracked on, um, would it knock you out? But let's not digress too far. Go in and watch last week's webinar, which is on YouTube for more on that. So number one, again, how long do you want to be in the position? So your volatility has to be enough to survive that time frame. And again, your stop is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go further and further out in time. So if you're here, your stop's going to be there. If you're here, your stop's going to be there in time. Okay. Now, keep in mind that if you were, let's say, you're day trading a blip or ticks, you know, maybe you could use a little bit, a little tiny stop and day trade a blip. Okay. But the tighter your stop, the more likely you're going to get stopped out. So the next question you need to ask yourself is how long, I'm sorry, how volatile is the underlying instrument? So a very similar chart, and we could put, you could have time and volatility on this same axis, but the higher your volatility, the more, the bigger, I should say, is the bigger your stop is going to have to be, okay? And then 
the next question you need to ask yourself is where would you obviously be wrong? So how long you want to be in it? How volatile is the underlying instrument? And where would the position be an obvious failure? Okay. Now let's take a look at that. This is somewhat obvious. In emerging trend patterns and in first pullback after base breakout and in newer patterns that we've been uh, recently introduced, such as pi what I call pioneer IPO patterns. Okay, let's look at some of these emerging trend patterns, or as I often call them, trend transitional patterns first. Now, right here, this is uh, a pattern I call the gatekeeper. This is the closest to a reversal that I will actually trade. And I probably drew it. I didn't draw it in to scale or when I put the or when I put this chart in here, it got stretched out. A gatekeeper really looks a little bit more like this, okay? A little bit more like that than like this. But let's just use the graph we have. Okay, and if you want the gatekeeper pattern, I'll give you the chapter out of that's in my second book. I'll give you the chapter for that. A little bit more advanced pattern. But let's say you enter here on a gatekeeper. Market begins to sell off. You think, okay, I got the mother of all tops. Well, as a trend follower, this is your new this is your new trend. This is your emerging trend. You're looking to short this market. Okay. I like it more on the downside than the upside. Uh, it's more of a shorting pattern, I find, at least uh, to my liking. But I know some people that use them on the upside. Um, and that's fine. Like I said, take what you like of my stuff and make it your own. So you know you can put it a stop somewhere up here. Now you can you can maybe give it a little bit of wiggle room up here, just in case it decides it wants to go in and make a double top and then roll over. But you know, okay, there's a hundred percent certainty that you are wrong if this is your trend. You're trying to catch a downtrend, and the stock makes a new high. The definition of a trend is a stock that's making new highs. That's one there's more than one definition of a trend obviously. But that's the most basic form of an uptrend at least is is if the stock is making a new high and continues to make new highs, then it's an uptrend. So you better get the heck out of the way if you're trading something like a gatekeeper and it goes on to make new highs. Okay? On a similar vein, and this is my poor attempt to just kind of draw, I probably should have used just a real example, but let's say you got a stock that bow ties, and I purposely try to make it kind of cup and handily looking because bow ties often uh, correspond with like a cup and handle type of pattern. And they're also forced when you have a first thrust type of pattern. By forced, I mean it almost has to bow tie once you have a first thrust. But let's focus on this bow tie first. So you got a market, let's say it's in a longer term downtrend doing this, okay? So the longer term trend is this, the intermediate or not so intermediate trend is this, mostly sideways. And then recently, it looks like it's beginning to turn back up, okay? So our goal is to catch that stock like a little solar stock or something back in 2012 or 2000, was it 2013, I'm sorry, 2013 when the solar stocks bottomed out, and then ride them for a couple of years, okay? And that was the goal back then. Right now, the goal in gold is to do just the same. So far, it hasn't worked greatly, but I think it uh, still has potential. Good questions coming in. I'm going to get to those in just one second. Um, so let's say you trigger into this bow tie. And, you know, so far, so good. It works for a day or two. Well, you know that if it comes back down and makes new lows, you're wrong. So you have a decision to make. Do you let it come all the way down to new lows to where you know you're wrong? Or do you say, well, maybe somewhere around here is close enough. I know I'm wrong. And I can always get back in at some other point in time if it begins to trend again. We're long a gold stock right now, which we can pull up in a few seconds. And if you look at it, it made a bow tie. And this is like your all-time low or 10-year low, whatever it is, I forget. And this was like our entry here, 
And I got to stop right around here. So it's in between it's in between the new low. Let me draw that again. Or let's draw it on here. The stop is in between the new low and the other lows. Because it looks like, you know, right around here it's kind of basic. And if it pulls back into that base, you have to question whether or not the position is failing. But you know for a fact the position is failing here. Now along the lines of the same vein. Let's say this could be like a longer term trend here that goes up, and then the market begins to consolidate at a high level range, and then all of a sudden it begins to peep out. Do we buy it here? No. Okay. Now, there are some breakout characteristics at IPOs, which we'll get to down here in a few seconds. But you don't buy it there, but it's like, okay, it's breaking it out. Let's play the first pullback. So you got the first pullback after a base breakout. That's something I'm writing about in a, um, a book I'm working on, which might take another two years to work, to work on it for three years. It'll probably take another two to finish. But first pullback after base breakout is a pattern there. Very simple pattern. No, no need to wait for the book. You're just looking for a, a base, and you're looking for a breakout out of the base. You look to play first pullback. So let's say you enter here, and then it begins to die. Okay, now you're bummed out. But you know this, if it pulls back into this base, then it's no longer this, it's this, okay? So it's pretty obvious in that case. By the way, see the little sad face here? Kirk report a few days ago, I like what he, uh, he, he quoted someone in there, and I'll have to, I have it in my, uh, in my Microsoft uh, notes, I have to find it. But he quoted someone that said that if people can look at your face and see and determine whether you're long or short a market, then your position size is too big. Now, it's funny, in putting together all this, I had all these thoughts on trading psychology. That's one of my favorite topics because I, too, fight all those psychological demons just because I have a pulse and decide, just because I'm sorry, just because I decided to trade doesn't mean I no longer have a pulse. I drop F-bombs. Um, I get excited, you know. But that's kind of made me think. It's like, okay, you know, if if, uh, if you can look at me and, and tell whether I'm having a good or bad day, then uh, maybe my size is a little too big, okay? And it, it kind of dovetails in. I don't want to go too far into psychology because I could talk for two hours in psychology. I could talk for ten hours in psychology. <laughs> but it dovetails in with uh, what I'm telling a client who I think is, I think he's finally turned a corner. And he's probably um, he's probably listening to me right now, so he knows who he is. He's out there, unless he's saving lives, which he saved one last week, by the way. Congratulations uh, on that. Uh, before I digress too far, but I think he's getting close because he used to trade for the excitement. He'd put on a bunch of trades, and sometimes in these highly volatile issues as a day trade, and then he'd go off to see some clients, and sometimes he'd go off to the side of the office and, Checking his positions while the client was still in the in the in the in the, in the room, so uh, he's learned not to go after the excitement anymore. And I told him, I said, once you begin to get it, it'll actually become a little bit boring. Now it's it's still I love what I do. It's still a pretty exciting career. But once you begin to get it, it does become a little bit boring because you're not you're not shooting from the hip. You're following a plan. It's much more fun and exciting to shoot from the hip and to not have a plan. But if you are following a plan and following a system, and if you're patient, sometimes there's nothing to do. If the market's going completely sideways, maybe you need to sit around and wait for something new to happen before taking new action. And that could be kind of boring. And But the boring I'm talking about is the actual execution of the trade and, and being in the trade. And, and, and that comes with getting your size right, okay? So like Charles Kirk said, the Kirk Report, uh, and I forget who he's quoting, and I'll, I'll, I'll give him credit. I can't pull it up. There's some stuff that I, um, personal items I, I have in my list, so I don't want to pull that up right now. But I'll... I'll I'm pretty bad about quoting people without giving them credit. So I'll, that's one thing I want to work on in 2050, but I'll get it for next week. But anyway, if somebody can look at you and see 
tell whether you're long or short a market, then maybe your size is a little too big. Okay. Anyway, I've digressed a little bit, but just remember that you got to ask yourself, where would you be wrong? You're going to be wrong here if it returns to the base. You're going to be wrong here if it makes new highs. You're going to be wrong here if it comes back down to new lows. And then you might say, well, somewhere in between. But give it plenty of wiggle room, okay? Because let's say like this stock does this, has big, big base, begins to take off, okay? So, yeah, back in the base, you might get out, but you might give it a little bit of wiggle room just in case. And let's say your lows are a little further down here, okay? You might not go all the way to that low, but if somewhere back at the base or thereabouts, okay? Now, if you're trading a first thrust, the market goes flying off the lows and pulls back a little bit, and you look to get in here. Once again, the old lows are an obvious place to put a stop, okay? Now, once again, depending on the size of the first thrust, this might be fairly sizable. So you need to ask yourself, where would this look to have failed as it approaches the old lows? And where should I get out just in case this is not finishing bottom? It goes back down and decides the bottom some other day. Okay? So that's what you have to ask yourself. And you can put that stop somewhere in between, but it would obviously be wrong here. So where is it obviously wrong? Okay? It's obviously wrong when an emerging trend goes on to make new lows for longs or goes on to make new highs for shorts. Write that down. Now, I'll show you a, a newer pattern that I've begun trading over the last year or two. And um, I won't give you the exact pattern, but let's just call it an IPO breakout. And you'll have a pretty good idea what it is. And by the way, that's in the IPO course, okay? So the new stuff comes out in the course or a book, and then eventually I just kind of give it away. But you're playing the breakout in an IPO. You have this limited history. Let's say this IPO comes public, goes down a little bit, and then begins to take off. Well, you know you're 100% wrong if it goes on to make new lows. And this is what I love about this pattern, unless this is really extreme, the distance from here to here. If it's not too extreme, you know for a fact that you're wrong here. And it makes life a lot easier knowing exactly where that stop needs to be placed. Because if that IPO goes on to make new lows, it might keep making new lows. If an IPO can't rally or can't sustain a rally, then something's wrong. Go in and watch the IPO teaser course which is on YouTube, and it's also on my website. If you go to the store, go to IPOs, there's a teaser course on there. And in that teaser course, I give a lot of the course away, and I explain that a lot of times with IPOs, they either fly or die, okay? And you want to buy the fly and avoid the die. They either die or they fly. Now, it's not a straight line up or down. There's some caveats involved. But sometimes they'll kind of do this, and they'll begin to take off. And if they can't sustain this, then they might be headed for this. So if they begin to make new lows, get out of the way. Because there's a good chance they'll turn into this. An IPO, if done properly, has everything in the world going for it, okay? And I stopped short of saying manipulation of the course. But let me tell you this. When that quiet period ends, you really think somebody's going to be stupid enough to bring a company public. And when the quiet period ends, they say, oh, yeah, our company's, uh, our company's a piece of crap. And, uh uh, it was stupid for us to bring it public, and uh, we don't have any any potential earnings. Uh, we'll never earn anything. Uh, uh, it's just uh, we suck. No. What, what are they going to say in their first press release? Oh, our earnings were better than they thought, or this drug is even more positive than we thought, and it looks like sales are going crazy. Well, let me tell you a little secret. 
I'd be willing to bet that that report was written three months ago. And I forget, I have to I have to look at my own course to tell you when the quiet period ends, but I think it's 120 days or three months. I forget. Somewhere, it, it might vary and change. But anyway, there is a quiet period. But when that quiet period gets lifted, guess what's going to happen? Some good news is going to come in, okay? And if the underwriters brought the company public properly, they they want to make money. So they have a vested interest in the stock going higher. So there's all this, and let me stop short of saying manipulation, but, okay, I guess I said it. There's all this, what I call BPO, happening. Now, I'm digressing a little bit here, but I want to make a good point. And I think uh, if you bear with me, you'll see I have one, okay? So let's call this the IPO, APO, and BPO, okay? So if they get their ducks in a row, they're going to get this stock out, and it's going to do what? It's going to go up, okay? Because you have VC back here, venture capitalists. You got the underwriters. You got a lot of people wanting this thing to succeed, okay? Now, I think I've built the case for IPOs need to be set up properly to go up. So what happens if they don't? Well, first of all, sometimes you get lucky and they just go down. They just award them. But if you do get triggered into one of these little pioneer patterns, what do you do? Well, you put a stop down here, considering that it's not too far away, okay? Too far can be a bit of arbitrary, but you get the picture. Compensate by trading fewer shares if it is somewhat far away. Or, like we did with the first thrust pattern, just say, well, it's, it's, it's a ways down there. Let me just give it some wiggle room, maybe to down here or something, because I don't want to go all the way to here. But if that's reasonably close, the beauty of that is that I try to put my stop down here as much as possible because I know that I'm 100% wrong at that level. The stock might decide to bottom out and turn around and go up, but I know that I'm wrong there. And there's a good chance, especially with an IPO, that it's going to continue lower. Now, in pullbacks... In pullbacks, not so much, okay? Anyone in here who's been trading for more than a day, anyone in here ever get stopped out trading a pullback and then the next day it takes off without you? We all have, okay? And then um, that's what Kite did, at least initially. It barely hit the mechanical stop, but then it turned around and went up, at least for a day or two. So let's say you've got a generic pullback. You trigger in here. And then, of course, the stock begins to die right after, unfortunately. Not of course, but unfortunately. So is this enough wiggle room? Is this enough wiggle room? And nope, it took out this big fat stop. Well, I guess this was enough wiggle room, okay? So in pullbacks, you don't know where exactly where to put that stop. And that's where the volatility comes in, the time that you want to be in the setup, and some of these other factors that we were talking about come in. Uh, thank you, Art. Art says, Richard L. Weissman is the quote that you're looking for in the Kirk Report. Yeah, Richard L. Weissman. Thank you. That way I don't have to look it up and then tell you next week. Uh, he had the quote about if you could look at your face and see if you're having a good or bad day, um, then – your position size is too high. Okay, now, real quick, let me just talk about a certain case for a tight stop. Let's say you have a really deep pullback in something, and that makes like an opening gap reversal. You're trying to get it early on that position. Well, you might play that opening gap reversal, and you might put it a stop like right here, okay? Like I said earlier, if you're only going to try to stay in the market for a very short period of time, so if you're doing a day trade, then maybe you could get a tight stop because the rubber band has really been stretched down here, and then you come in overnight, and maybe I should exaggerate, maybe the gap needs to be like down here or something, but not so much to where it looks like the complete trend is broken. But you know that the rubber band is stretched a long, long ways, and if it doesn't seem to be going down any further and it starts going up a little bit, 
maybe you could put the, top, the stop in right there. Another case might be, let's say you have a witch hat. And a witch hat is a pattern I like on the downside more than the upside. The rest of my patterns, I like them equally upside, downside, doesn't matter. But the witch hat, I like on the downside. The gatekeeper, I like. I'm sorry, the witch hat, yeah, the witch hat I like for trend on the downside. And the gatekeeper, I like on the downside. And all the other patterns, I like eh, pretty much equally on both sides of the market. Uh, I'd rather go long than short a market, but you have to dealt the hand that's, uh, you have to play the hand that's dealt. But sometimes in a gatekeeper, you might take a, I'm sorry, in a, uh, well, a gatekeeper too, but in a witch hat, you might take a stab at a market and put your stop in fairly close to that market. Because what happens is you got such a reversion to the bean move already back to this prior peak. Now, I'm not saying a witch hat looks like, looks like that, okay? That's not a witch hat. Which hat needs to be a very, very defined V, almost to the point where it's a bit of a failure. It's like the market is flying off the lows, looks like a bottom. It's almost a failure. It goes right back down. Okay. So in this particular case, you get the prior peak in there. You might be able to put in a stop fairly tight, maybe an entry here, stop right here, and just above that high. So there are certain cases where you could use tight stops. Now, this is something I want to throw in. Remember, we were. I was trying to figure out a way earlier in the slides to to combine time plus volatility, and then I realized that I had some some um, previously made graphics where I use a volatility projection. So what this does is it looks back in time and says, "Oh, okay, uh, based on the historical volatility, I see that the market did this. So let's project that up." And let's project that out. That's called a volatility cone. I don't have much use for that because I know that that's how markets work. But it looks good on paper, and it's something you could experiment with and mess around with. And the options people love this kind of stuff, okay? Because it's like, oh, well, let's just buy a straddle, and it's going to be worth a, a bazillion dollars here, you know, and it'll be worth a bazillion dollars here, okay? And then in reality, it's like it... <laughs> Market than flat lines, okay? That that volatility goes does this, but I digress, and that's another that's another whole can of worms there, okay? But you can see that the further you get out in time, it becomes obvious that the and it would be kind of fun. Um, somebody with a quote feed up. Where was the uh, where were the peas, the spiders? Let's see where they ended up. Where were the spiders? And, and just Type it into questions. Where were the spiders on this day here? I guess they were. I guess we know that. Yeah, they were at 164.11, somewhere in there. So they had 164. Okay. So let's see. Where did they end up in this cone? Let's let's say the middle of December. Just for our S and Gs, let me know where it ended up. And that'd be kind of a fun little exercise. But based on statistics, if you're trying to put statistics to a market, then this market, which is the spiders, which which aren't that volatile, an HV of about 13 now. I don't know what the HV was back then, but it could have been much more than 13, if 13. Projected out one, two, three and a half months. It's either going to be way up here or way down here. Okay. So if you want to try to hold this for three and a half months, if you're long, your stop would have to be right here. Okay. And if you're short, your stop would have to be up here, 181. Now look at that. That's fascinating. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, so the market ended at 181. So the volatility didn't fully reflect this volatility. Looking backwards, didn't fully reflect the future volatility. Okay, it actually exceeded that. That's that's a propensity we use to our advantage and and I think we did it last week a week before and those are on YouTube too um, I don't want to tell you about things when they're not accessible so that's why I keep saying YouTube where if done properly when you get into a trade you get an expansion in volatility and you get an expansion in price okay so in this particular case the volatility did expand and it 
ended up outside of this band. One thing I wanted to talk about is if you're using statistics, one of the problems is, and this is not a good example, but one of the problems is that statistical-based stop is going to be really, really large, okay? Um, a lot of people use ATRs. Well, what ATR are you using? And, and I, again, I eyeball the chart. So I am using ATR, but I'm eyeballing it, okay? But if you use some sort of hard statistics like a, a big ATR, especially when you're factoring in the length of the trade, such as this, you can see that that stop gets pretty wide if you want to hold that for that duration. Now, I saw for this by just trying to solve, just kind of by whether the short term, which would be here, a week or two of trading, and then hopefully it turns into the long term. Hopefully it ends up here at 181 or 191 or 2001 or whatever. Okay, but you have to, when you try to project out that far, your volatility based on statistics can be quite large. So that makes it um, tough. And I actually put that in the slide. Again, unfortunately, the statistics can be quite large. And then obviously, I guess if you would have shorted this market, then you got stopped out here, which would have been a pretty big, sizable stop for the S&P, for the underlying instrument. And then the market goes on to end up at, what, 181. Okay. Now, common sense is your best friend when it comes to setting stops. Number one, eyeball it. Now, this makes people nuts when I say eyeball it. But Dave, where exactly you put it? Well, let's let's take a look at it. Uh, where, you know, you know, where do you when I when I mentor someone, I tell them they don't say. I don't say. Uh, it, you know, it's more work for you if you're mentor with me. It's going to be a lot more work. Than if you're just asking me questions, because I'm going to ride you, like a buddy of mine says, I'm going to ride you like Sea Biscuit, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to ride you pretty hard, and I'm not going to say, "Oh yeah, that stock looks good, go buy it." I'm going to say, "Okay, well, where are you going to buy it? Where's your stop going to be? And let me see your plan." Okay. So if you eyeball it, and the stock is moving around four and five points a day then your stop has to be outside of that normal shorter term volatility. You don't need any fancy statistics to tell you that. Just look at the stock. And I said I said to myself at the beginning of this presentation, I'm not going to tell the story again, but I, I, it, I think it, it, it bears worth repeating. Um, I was in San Fran a couple of years ago speaking to the TSAA, San Francisco Technical Analysis Society, uh, TSAA of San Francisco, I think, and um, good organization, by the way. Its membership's open to everyone, um, and um, I was a member last year. I haven't renewed yet, but uh, I likely will. Anyway, long story endless. Uh, I know, too late. I was talking about, I was showing like a 20% stop or something. I forget what it was, but let's just for argument's sake, let's say 20% stock stop, an extremely volatile stock, and some guy starts moaning and groaning in the audience, uh, and, you know, oh, I follow a method where you only use an 8% stop. And I'm like, well, that's fine, but if you only use an 8% stop and a stock moves 10 15% a day, you're guaranteeing yourself a loss going into the trade. And he argued back and forth with me, but my point is using an 8% stop is like saying, and here it comes, you guys heard this before, it's like saying that everyone should wear a size medium shirt, Okay. My fat ass had wore a medium shirt since I was probably seven years old. <laughs> okay, I exaggerate, since I was probably four years old, right? Um, depending on the designer, I'm in a triple X, okay? <laughs> the minimal is, a, is an XL. I got an XL on now, and it's kind of tight on me. Since the camera's off, I figured I could wear it, get away with it. I got dressed in the dark. I get up for my wife, so I got to get dressed in the dark, um, which explains the pink panties, but uh, that's, another, that's another conversation. Um, anyway, don't overthink it, okay? Just don't, just just use common sense, okay? If a stock is doing this, then your stop needs to be outside of that range, okay? Uh, the depth of the pullback can help with for generic pullbacks because you do have a reversion to the mean move. Unfortunately, it could also uh, increase the volatility a little bit, but as a general statement, the more the rubber band is stretched this way, if you want to try to get away with a tight stop, 
the closer your stop can be, and that makes you a little bit more of a reversion to the bean player. But we are reversion to the bean players in the direction of the trend. Thank you, Heather. Well, yeah, it's a thong, too, and, and it's making me nuts. I can't wait to get done with the show and, and go put on a proper pair of, uh, of underwear. <laughs> I'm kidding, as far as you know. Um, sometimes you can have textbook stops. Okay, and I, I use the word wide enough TKOs. What's a wide enough TKO? Well, every now and then you'll have just this beautiful TKO. You have something that's really nicely trending, and then, bam, you have this big old knockout move. Well, if this stock triggers, let's say it's let's say the the close is right here, and this is a beautiful pattern, FYI. Go and look at that. I think CTLT was a good example of that. Uh, I have one called an Arbalist TKO somewhere out there, floating around the, the internet in some of these presentations. But if it closes way down here, if this thing could come all the way back up into your trigger, okay, here's your trend, and triggers, it should not go back down and retest this level. So sometimes when you have this textbook TKO, you can put your stop just slightly below that low, and your entry is right above the high, okay? If you're on a trading service, or even if you're not on a trading service, just ask me for the archives, and I'll give you the more, I'll give you the last year or so, because I think that's when a couple of those those textbook TKOs came out. But if you're not, if you're not on a trade, if you're on a trading service, scroll down on the service page, and you have every recommendation for the last year or so, and then if you look on the marketing page for the service, you've got every recommendation for the last 10 years, okay, at least. But in going through those, if you if you have enough time to download and go through those, you'll see that occasionally we trade a TKO in a textbook kind of fashion. I think the CTLT was a good example on that. Don't quote me. I'll look at the records and see if that was the one. But I think the CTLT was the one that made this beautiful little TKO, which is very textbook in nature. Entry above the high, stop below the low. So that's what stop was on that. Now, ask yourself, what is the least amount of room I could give this position and it will still work, okay? It's kind of a, if you, if you look at it on a statistical basis, your stop is going to have to be this wide. And that's the problem with, this. that's, that's how wide your stop's going to have to be, okay, as a general rule. But... You need to ask yourself, well, I can't, I probably shouldn't risk that much because obviously way down here the position looks like it has failed or would look like it has failed, okay? But maybe I could give it to like right here because if it makes it all the way to here, it's on its way to failing. Let me redraw that without so much stuff, okay? Let's say statistics say this. Well, you look at it and just say, well, it really shouldn't go much below this level here. If it gets below that level here, it's probably failed, okay? So where would the position be a failure? And you use your mind's eye and, and, and project that forward and imagine what that stock would look like should that occur, okay? And maybe that's where your stop needs to go, somewhere around there, okay? Now, the next question to ask yourself, is this is the HV super high? It is crazy volatile. A general rule of thumb is anything above 100, you need to really question whether or not you want to trade it. We took a little uranium stock recently. It was above 100. We got stopped out. Some of the gold stocks now, it is what it is. They, they're all above 100, um, and they're crazy volatile. It is what it is. You've got to decide whether or not you're going to trade them. But in general, if something's over 100, think about it seriously because that stock has bounced around and it's been all over the place. 80 to 100, you know it's going to be super volatile. Even 60 or 70 on the 50-day HV, that's a little high, okay? But once you hit those triple digits, you know it's, it's, it's just going too crazy. Now, if you're getting stopped out a lot, as I tell a story, ad nauseum, somebody was stopped out 19 times, somebody was stopped out 21 times. And I've actually had several emails right around that 20 figure. If you're trading my methodology, you're doing two things wrong. Your stops are too tight or your stop selection might need a little bit improvement. Okay, warning, soft sell ahead. Okay, if you avoid 
one bad trade, you've paid for the course and then some. So I do have a course on stock selection out there. Okay. So again, sometimes your best defense is a good offense. Pick the best stocks to begin with. And I've come to the realization after years of doing this, and this is why in 2013, in the 2013, I did a stock selection course, that that's the missing piece. Because I wrote my first book and I said, you know, I just told everyone, I just tell everybody everything I know, and that's all I need to know. And then in the second book, it's like, well, I've got these newer patterns, and, and there's a few other things, and we need to tweak it a little bit. So this is now it's everything I know. And then after the after thousands of emails, I realized, well, the missing piece is the stock selection. So we got psychology figured out. Okay, easier said than done. I know. We got the money management pretty much nailed down. Okay, common sense mostly. But what's the missing piece? Well, a good offense. So your best defense is a good offense. So you want to pick the best stocks to begin with. So if I can help you avoid one or two losing trades, well, one trade, that you have um, paid for the course. Uh, we're running late, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. And this is something I didn't have time to build a, build a slide on. Let me cover this real quick, and then I'm going to go back, and uh, just so I know I've got everything covered. And then I will go back and do the... Um, um, the stops. Oops. All right, we lost it. All right, no problem. I'll go back and answer. All. We got a ton of questions on stops, so let's do this. Okay. Now, resistance once broken becomes support. I'm sorry, that's not what I want to say. Uh, someone asked me this. Let's say it was a short position, and the market did this. And then it went up and did this, okay. And you had entry right around here. Well, his his say was, well, don't you have some support here? If you're trying to short, won't the market find support? And it's possible, but once you break through that resistance, so you got a resistance level. Once you break through it, okay, then that resistance, and let's say you come back up, this resistance is less important now than it was before. And in this particular case, by the time you enter, you're entering here. And the reason I put the stock as a uh, in my Landry list was because by the time you entered, you pretty much had cleared most, if not all, of that resistance. Okay? But even if you didn't, the point is that once you break through that resistance, okay, even if you pull back up, it negates it to some extent. Dave, to what extent? I don't know. But and somebody might try to put some volume calculations to it. And maybe that's fodder for research. I don't know. Um, I prefer to keep it simple. I don't worry about it as much. I know it's not a exact, but I don't worry about that support or resistance as much once it's been sliced through. Okay. Now, what do you mean once it's been sliced through? Well, let's say that you've got a market down here and it begins to rally up. Okay. You haven't taken out that resistance yet. So I know that we're likely to have some problems when we hit that resistance. And this is part of the stock selection course. It's also in the teaser webinar on the stock selection course. So watch that uh, if you haven't already done so. But once you get through that resistance, um, coming through it again, it's going to be a little bit different, and it's not quite as strong. Not that the market doesn't still have the bad memories, but I'm not as worried about it. We could certainly revisit it. I know it kind of went through that quickly. Now, a lot of questions on stops and such. So let's get those knocked out, and then we'll open it up for um, for individual issues. So I'll take a look at the market, too. Okay. Is there an alternative entry at the bottom of NVR trading in a dead money range? No. No. Okay. So his question, I assume you mean was. Um, okay. If you uh, you know, and if you miss a trade, uh, like S N S A N D is a recent example. I can't pull it up on my charts while I'm in the middle of this show. But let's say let's say you have a stock and it triggers like right here and it comes back in a little bit. Then you might want to take a second entry on that trade. Let's say that this particular stock we were using a textbook entry, meaning it will get in right there, just for examples. And it kind of came up, it came back in. Well, you could still enter above that high, okay? 
Now, we gave it a little bit of wiggle room. It didn't actually trigger to here, trigger to here, but a textbook trigger would have been here. The stock is, as long as the stock is still set up, you could buy it, okay? But once it triggers, and then it begins to consolidate like this, there was no second entry on this. So if somebody's new to the service, and I know, I know Shay, you're new to the service. I think Shay came in somewhere around here, okay? Well, he asked me what to do, or what, or someone that knew, that came in. I don't know if it was you or not, but he asked me what to do about AVRL, and I said just let it go. Don't 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 try to trade it, um, because it's just going sideways. But Dave, you said you said it's dead. You said it's not dead money. Well, I didn't know it wasn't dead money, but what I do is I have a plan, and that plan is to buy the best stocks at the best time. And that was right there. At least I thought it was right there, okay? And what do I do in the future? I follow that plan, okay? Well, on this particular day or this day or this day or this day or this day, the stock wasn't set up, so there's nothing to do as far as new action if you miss the trade. So you want to obsess before you get into a trade, and, and as I often say, not afterwards, but definitely obsess before you get into that trade. But if you miss the trade and it's no longer set up, then let it go. There will be other ones down the road, okay? So there was not, to answer your question, there was no, there was no secondary trade from where I stand in that uh, one, okay? After the first IPT, would you add to a stock on basis of stock doing well? Okay, that's, some, that's something we cover quite often, too. The only time you add to a stock is that if it sets up again. So let's say you have on two units here. You throw out one unit at the IPT. Okay, minus one. Two minus one is one. Pulls back again. Sets up. Looks pretty good. You could put back on one unit. Okay, I call that swing trading around the core position. Now, that's something that I recommend verbally in my service, but I don't come out and recommend it on an exact basis and maybe that's maybe I should do that but it's going to add a layer of complexity people could get confused I'm getting 100 emails on what do you mean I don't understand so I just tell people verbally hey this stock is still set up or set up again looks pretty good you want to do an add-on trade for those who missed it knock yourself out looks pretty darn good I think it might be worth a shot okay but yes personally I will put shares back on and then flip them out I call that swing trading around a core position. So, so to answer your question, yes. Now you're not pyramiding; you're in and out. You're trading around that core position. But an intraday high could take you out your stop and then close down to continue the trend down. Uh, I'm not sure what you're saying, uh, Leon, because I, uh, that was probably 10 slides ago. Uh, but as a generic answer to that. Yeah, it happens, and it's spelled with a silent S-H. Uh, something always could happen. Dave, lately those pullbacks for version B trades are not working. Well, what's the market doing? It looks like most of the vehicles is taking off and not looking back. Um, I'm not seeing that so much. I, I mean, there's uh, pullback trades, and version B trades and what? I mean, the market's going sideways, you know. I mean, uh, this one worked. And then I don't have the portfolio snapshot up, but quite a few work lately. I mean, it's, knock on wood, it's been pretty good in spite of the sideways action in the market. Now, those positions were established, some of them were established before the market went sideways. The example is oil. Well, oil is a very efficient market. I've got an article coming out on efficiency, so um, you might want to check that out when it does. Right now, it's in, it's in Germany, as I said this morning in the column. It's in Traders Magazine. But, yeah, uh, so you say it all just trended, didn't even have a mean reversion? Yeah, sometimes it does, okay? Uh, sometimes it can happen. Um, the goal is, hopefully, and this is not a, I don't want to make it sound like it, it, it's always the case, but, but you had a multi-year bow tie in, in, in oil, okay? So your ultimate goal would be to get in on this bow tie, okay? And by the way, if you're going to trade in the efficient market, Forex, commodities, uh, some ETFs, or most ETFs, I should say, and all you did was trade emerging trend patterns off of multi-year highs and multi-year lows, I think you'd do very well. I think you'd sit on your hands a lot, but I think you'd do very well. Write that down. I just paid for your webinar. 
I just paid for this webinar. Okay, write that down. So you got a multi-year high. You get a bow tie. You get a okay. So yeah, we didn't get a reversion to the mean move, but but that's great. As a trend follower, look at that. Okay, that's the mother of all trends. Keep an eye on the currencies now. Keep an eye on the dollar. Okay. Dollar again, rolling over. I'm short. FYI. I know that pullback will start working again, but right now they looks like they're not working. Well, um, yeah, I mean if you if if done properly, you get into a market and it never looks back. Okay. Now your next play here is going to be a bow tie to the upside. So once once you get this far into a trend, especially in something like oil or any other emerging, I'm sorry, any other efficient type of market, then what you might say is, okay, I missed that last bow tie down, but I'm not going to miss the next bow tie up, okay? And maybe that will pay for your webinar too. Can you please what you said about uh, base breakout pullbacks into base? Yeah, if you are in a stock and a, a good little pattern is first pullback after base breakout. This is really a good example here, but let's assume the stock based like it did here. And let's say it breaks out and let's say it goes higher and, and, and not in just one big chunk like this. Let's say it just kind of peeped out and sort of working its way higher. Well, look to play that first pullback, okay, let's say enter here, and if it triggers, it comes all the way back into this base, then you're wrong because you had the base, it went up, it came back in, okay? Sometimes you get lucky, you hit the initial profit torque, it comes back in, no worries, but sometimes you get that pullback comes back into the base. Same, you know, whether it's a high-level base, you're playing that first pullback at the base breakout, or whether it's a low-level base like this, okay? And then it begins to take off. If it pulls back into that base, then you're wrong, or you're likely wrong. If you could stomach the old lows, then yeah, use the old lows when you're down here at low levels. Okay? Great questions. I probably should, uh, there goes my lunch. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to talk about my thong. <laughs> yeah, hang on. Let me take it off. Hang on. Oh, it's better. Oh, nobody comes in. <laughs> What percentage would you get stopped out? Depends. I mean, earlier in 2014, we had 100% winners, like 10 stops. They didn't. They weren't big winners, but then they eventually got stopped out. So 100%. Uh, I guess you get stopped out 100% of your trades. Is that what you're saying? That percent being stopped out is too high. What percentage get stopped out? A percentage get stopped out is. Can you rephrase? I'm not sure what you're saying. If market conditions. Or crappy, or turn crappy, you're gonna get stopped out of everything. I don't, I don't understand the question. Okay, so let's say you're long a bunch of stocks and the market tanks, so you're gonna get stopped out of 100% of your stocks. And eventually, you will get stopped out of 100% of your stocks. Okay, sometimes it takes two years, sometimes it takes two months, sometimes it takes two days. Sometimes, as someone alluded to a minute ago, it happens and you get stopped out in two minutes. Okay, sometimes you'll get whacked. Sometimes it'll take off and then come right back in. For support resistance, just look left. Yes. Well, you can't look right. <laughs> find, a, find a broker that lets you trade off the left side of the chart and give me a phone call, okay? <laughs> Who is it? Um, Alan Farley. He calls his site the hard right edge. He uh, syndicates my column over there, by the way, or at least the market in a minute, I think. Can you, can you expand? Well, it looks like we're running too late, so we might need to. to I mean, Robert, I know you're the guy who started this question uh, This question to begin with. Can you expand in more detail on how about translate volatility to actual place you can stop, perhaps by using considering uh, different HVs? Well, you can't, you can't turn HV into a purely statistical stop. That's the whole point I'm trying to make is that you can't use a purely statistical stop because it's going to be, too crazy. Where is this? Okay, so this is what an HV stop looks like, and it could it could be too crazy. So you'd have to be. I can't draw a straight line, but you know this thing's hard. Okay, so your stop would have to be way down here. 
So that's the point. But HV can tell you, okay, wait a minute, I've got a tiger. I got a tiger on my hands. In fact, I actually had a pattern years ago called sleeping tigers, uh, where you look for a high HV stock to drop in volatility, and then look for that volatility to expand back out. It was cool stuff. That's back when I was really into, really like uh, a, a volatility junkie before it came a momentum junkie. Um, but all that stuff kind of translates into the momentum. So yeah, um, that's tough. The, the problem. I'm gonna. I'll upload it to YouTube, and then you're right. I, uh, also, when you put this uh, weekend charts on YouTube on the service so I can watch the full. Yeah. Uh, right now, I've been putting everything on YouTube, or the last couple of weeks at least. I think I'm going to continue along with that as long as everybody seems to appreciate it. Uh, but, yeah, if you're on the service, sometimes I will learn load them to my private server. And, and, but you, you, uh, I do give you, as a courtesy, access to those. Uh, so, yeah, check the service page. You shouldn't have to ask me. Robert asks me every week or some or it might not be you, Robert. Somebody's like, hey, can you upload? It's like, yeah, I'm uploading it. Just give me a minute. Um, okay. Yes, but it's easier method is simply to eyeball the volatility and just set it on your experience. Well, that's one thing I thought about as I was getting some water earlier before this presentation. I was thinking that it, there is an art to it, but the art is definitely teachable. But the missing piece is going to be uh, experience. And Robert's been asking me a lot of questions about stops lately. And this is, this is the reason why we're spending – now I guess an hour and 15 minutes just on stops. He had a lot of questions on them. And that's one thing I was thinking about a few minutes ago is that it's going to take some experience, but use all this common sense things that I'm telling you and, and put that in. And if you want to email me a couple of stocks and say, okay, Dave, I'm looking at this stock, where would the stop go? Or better yet, no, 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 don't do that. Pretend that you're mentoring with me and say, okay, Dave, I'm looking at this stock. This is where I think my stop should be, and let me either agree or disagree or agree to disagree with you, and once you kind of get your head wrapped around that, you can say, well, I kind of get this eyeball thing, where it ask yourself, you need to rewatch this presentation and ask yourself all those questions, and then unfortunately, and again, this is what I was thinking about earlier, it is an art more than science, and it is going to take some experience, and you are going to have to get stopped out a few times. Okay, and you do get stopped out. You need to ask yourself, was my stop wrong or was my stock selection bad? Okay. Uh, one of the beautiful things, and I've been trying to catch up on, on my accounting on the mechanical portfolio, discretionary portfolio, et cetera. It's funny when conditions are great. I'm like, I'm updating it every ten minutes <laughs> with conditions. When you have a choppy year, like sort of like 2014. With the, with the market with that, with the buy and hold wins, I'm, 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 it takes me forever to get the accounting done. And a few of you have been riding my butt on that. But um, one thing I've noticed is that going back and, and doing it over the years, when I go back a few years, I find myself asking myself less and less and less what was I thinking. When I go way back in time, when I go back 10 years and look at some of these positions, I think, what was I thinking? Even though we had some good years in there, there are quite a few trades where I'm thinking, what was I thinking? So whenever I take a trade now, I ask myself, hey, in the future, am I going to come back and look at this and think, what was I thinking? And if I can honestly answer that question, and it's and it's not, you know, what's what do they say in market wizards? It's it's uh, intuition and not into wishing. Then I take the trade. Now, not to brag, but I'm feeling better and better that I'm finding fewer and fewer trades as I go back when I when I do this accounting on things. Now, doesn't mean it don't have losses. And if you do have a loss in a trade, you have to do the forensics on that trade. Go back and say, all right, let's go back to day one. Would I take this setup if I was just saying it's seeing it today? Okay? Forget about what you know about gold. Forget about what you know about the situation in Nigeria or any other place and the stock market, and anything else that's happened between now and back then. But just look at that kind of like in a bubble, or kind of like in a vacuum, I should say. And if it looks great, and you got stopped out anyway, guess what? So what? Okay? You know longer term, you're going to get an NVRO, a kite, you're going to get a KITE, and some of these other little stocks we've been trading have done f absolutely fantastic. You're just going to have to keep chipping away at it. And that same exact pattern, sometimes it may work and sometimes it don't. Well, the beauty 
and the reason why certain methodologies work, and this is gonna this is gonna kind of screw your brain up a little bit, but the reason some of these methodologies or any methodology works is because sometimes it don't. Okay, all right. My business is building up. Market is trending. Market is trending. Okay, got a couple of real estate agents came to me, husband and wife team, and I know. <laughs> I'm thinking of more than one, so they're probably thinking, hey, you're talking about us. They made 20% in the first three or four months with me. They're ready to quit their real estate business and just trade. I'm like, whoa, 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 settle down, Beavis. We're having a pretty good run here. Just hang in there, enjoy the ride, but realize that there's going to be some choppy times in here. And anybody that's been with me for a while knows that for a fact. Okay. I was talking yesterday with someone. It's like it's a lot easier to sell the sizzle than it is to sell a steak. And um, he was explaining that if you have a, if you have an actual service where you're giving actual entry prices and stops and, and all that, it's a lot harder. You're, you're held under a microscope there. Okay, it's much easier to just throw out some powder and say, "This is how you make a million dollars," and then you go off, and then you just kind of you kind of. Uh, be a little elusive as to exactly how it all works, okay? A lot harder to be out here in reality land. I'd make a lot more money if I would I would I would sell some more excitement as opposed to selling reality. Well heck, we just spent an hour and ten minutes talking about stops, okay? I, you know, I go out there and find someone on the internet that's that's gonna spend that much time on money management. Everybody else is gonna be talking about, oh this is all great and and, and give me all your money or give me a bunch of money and, and you have the secret to the market. Okay. Anyway, I digress. I digress way too far. Okay. Let's take a look. Okay. Uh, what number of days would you eyeball a stock in terms of the last couple of weeks uh, of volatility? I mean, just look at the last five days, last ten days, okay? And just and just look at you know, what moves has it made in the past? What moves will it likely continue to make in the future? Okay. Um, you know, this stock here, we didn't really have an HV until somewhere in here. Uh, so I don't know exactly what the HV was. But it was down here in the 20s or, 50, or somewhere in the 20s. And it ran up to uh, almost 40, almost. So that's a 100% move. And then some of these days in here, Let's see what they are. It's, it's 30 here. That's 35. This is like a that's like a six point move. Okay. So I'm looking at this. I think we ended up with about a six and a half point stop, but it has the potential to make that those kind of moves. So just look at the last couple of weeks. Look at look at the net net change. That's one thing I left out. Look at the net net change. Okay. This thing went from here to here. That's a hundred percent move, and it's also let's say. Round numbers, about 20 bucks. I'm just eyeballing it. So just about 20 points, give or take a little. So it went 20 points in like a month. So it could move a lot and really fast. So I know that I'm going to have to have a fairly sizable stop on this stock in order to ride those moves. So keep it simple, okay? And we can come back to it next week. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. All right, let's take a look at the. This is the longest I've ever lectured. My uh, my apologies if you're bored. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at the overall market. Just a few things I want to look at. Let's open up to individual stocks too, and I'll, I'll go a little long today. Uh, if you guys oh, hang in there, I try to keep the recordings fairly uh, within reason due to the um, uh, the go to webinar software. I'm getting a little nervous after about an hour and a half or so. Let's take a look at the overall market. And then let's take a look at the some sectors in here. Now, today the market's still soft again, but we did bounce. We did kind of bounce back a little bit, okay? So it's flattish in here. So we did find a little support at the bottom of the trading range. Now, you can't get too excited when you're at the bottom of the range. Like I said this morning's column, like it's going to be – you can't project – the, the, the ride down to the bottom of the range. You can't do this, okay? Sometimes it'll break that range and keep on going. Sometimes it won't. More often than not, it probably won't, okay? 
So we got up to the top of the range back here, and it sure felt good. And I bet you a thousand bucks. I I don't I don't remember, but I bet I probably dusted off one of my market at new highs. So is this the all clear column? I mean, is this yeah one of those columns where I talk about hey everything's great in the world, right? Settle down. Maybe not. But then notice that we came back down towards the bottom of the range. A lot of bears right here. Oh, that's it. We're going to die. What happens? Well, it rallies back up. Okay. Rallies back down. Oh, a lot of bears. Oh, we're going to die. Rallies back up. Now where are we? We're back to the bottom of the range. Okay. The point is to wait but not anticipate. Okay. The bottom line is this market has gone sideways for quite some while. So just draw your sideways arrows, okay? And if you have TC, just go and go back in time and hit your C key. And never forget about the net net change in markets. As long as that arrow is going sideways, you don't want to take a lot of action. Now one thing I was thinking about today is you don't know. You know, maybe when you're back here, you don't know the market's going sideways. But surely, by the time you're right here, and even right here, okay, you know that the market's going sideways. So that's where you need to say, okay, let me back off a little bit in my trading. And let me get really, really selective. And you know what? Instead of trading today, I'm going to go and watch that course on stock selection. Or I'm going to at least spend enough time and watch that that intro seminar out there on YouTube. And I'm going to be a little bit more selective in my trading, especially since the market's going sideways. Market going straight up, you don't need a stock selection course, okay? Just buy everything. Just buy the overall market, okay? But it's when the market's beginning to chop around a little bit or it's not going exactly straight up or exactly straight down for shorts that you have to work a little bit. GoPro earnings, I don't care about GoPro earnings. Do you? I could care less. Camera on a stick. <laughs> I might have to get one, though. I just, uh, I don't get out much, but boy, you know, some of these idiots driving, I'd love to have a camera just to, to film some of these things. The problem would be that if the camera's, if the voice is rolling, you'd, you'd hear my reaction. These people, like, pull out in front of you, and there's, like, nobody behind you for about six miles. And then they go 10 miles an hour. It's like, what? <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. A little bit of a sell-off today off its worst levels, though, so it's recovering a little bit. And this is why you can't get too caught up in the day-to-day. -day. Yeah, we're down 3% in three days or 3% in two days, whatever it is. And I'm not happy about that, but the market hasn't come unglued just yet. Let's take a look at bonds. Well, let's take a look at Rusty first, and then we'll take a look at bonds. Um, before I forget, I kind of forget often to take a look at bonds. Rusty kind of flats the one today. And it always amazes me that you have a day like yesterday where everybody and their brother has to sell stocks, and then the next day, eh, the show to shrug. It makes no sense whatsoever. But I've seen it a 1,000 times. I've probably seen it 10,000 times. If you add up every single stock and every single index and ETF that I've looked at throughout the year and commodity, where they do just that. They just have these big days where everybody their brother's got to sell. The next day, all of a sudden, eh, not so much. So we got a bit of a eh day so far, at least in the Russell 2000. But like I said earlier, it's just stuck in a huge, big picture, wide range. I mean, this is a poster child for an electrocardiogram, right? Is it going up? Is it going down? I don't know. Okay, how, how can you be bullish? How can you be bearish on this market? It's going sideways. Okay, before I forget, let's take a look at bonds. Um, bonds at least basis the uh, this contract are at all time highs. Now I don't. I'm pretty sure there's there's some problems with the 30 year note, so we probably need to look at the 10 year note. It's it's not enough time to get into it, but the, they stopped issuing 30 year notes a while back. And then they start reissuing them uh, based on the debt structure of the United States. 
but that's that's a conversation for another. We, that's that's a that's a conversation over beer. And if um, if we're drinking beer, let's let's talk about something more exciting than that. Anyway, uh, all time highs and bonds. So it means those rates are at all time lows for the most part. What's the rate? TNX, which is off the ten year. Yeah, not quite all time lows in the ten year. By the way, um, you know, I'm going to pay for your webinar once again. If you have a mortgage, start thinking about refinancing. I don't know where your mortgage rate is, and don't ask me for advice on that. I'm not allowed to give advice on that anyway, but um, you're down towards these all-time lows. Okay, Let's see if we get a quarterly chart. Okay, See, this is way back to the 60s. Okay, and This is interest rates. They won't go down forever. And what's going to happen with interest rates is, and you mark my words, especially since they're this low, is everybody's going to rush to the door at the same time, and you're going to see a huge spike. Once they begin to spike higher, they're going to go straight up, I think, because people don't people don't take action while rates are dropping. They take actions when the rates drop, but they go to go back up look take look right here case in point okay look what happened once they start going up all of a sudden they're going to start going straight up okay and it's going to happen really fast when it does okay so just kind of mark my words on that and hopefully a year from now and all this is out there being documented so we'll see um some of these areas at high levels beginning to scare me take a look at insurance probing the bottom of its range I wouldn't rush out and sell, but I certainly wouldn't buy at these levels, okay? Uh, real estate, so far, so good. Acted more like a momentum stock. My problem is the HV is just so low, HV of 11. Something bad can still happen. I saw a couple of REITs get whacked recently. So it's damned if you do and damned if you don't. You, you buy some of these sleepy REITs because they're moving well, and then you get whacked in them. And that's the whole argument about trading volatile versus lower volatility stocks so but so far they're still in a trend I might be forced to trade them um, there's a lot of these other areas that are just kind of hovering around their prior highs in here and that's no big shocker kind of like the market itself some of them are approaching new lows like insurance and software and some of them like I think the semis if memory serves yeah sort of stalled after reaching their prior highs, okay? So either way, it's not good. Either way, though, it's still the sideways arrows. A lot of areas sideways arrows. Um, some areas a little concerning in here or certainly down towards the bottom of the range, like hardware, okay? And then what else is going on? A couple areas that are still trending nicely, like drugs and biotech, have gotten hit a little bit in here lately, but so far the trend still remains up. But obviously, we have stops on those positions just in case. Banks are a major, 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 major concern of mine. If you're on the service or if you read my column even, you'll see that I've been talking about them forever, making me nervous, or at least the last couple of weeks. If these guys begin to crack in earnest, they've got a long ways to go. Now, I could give a flip about banks. Okay, I don't trade banks that often. They kind of choppy. I'm just not a big fan of them. They can be lower in volatility. It depends on the bank and all. But I'm just not a big fan of banks. But what concerns me, the reason I'm obsessing over them is because I think that you could have a ripple effect through the markets. And I was on the panel with um, Timing Research, which I do every week, if you guys know. It's a great show. Um, I have a blast doing it. I'm glad that they've invited me back. I seem to be the new host, but I don't want to uh, assume that. I just uh, I get asked every week, and I accept. But someone pointed out, and again, I, I need to. It's hard for me to remember who's who because I can't really take notes because I'm listening and I'm asking the questions. But somebody pointed out that um, in each week we tend to talk a lot about oil, and maybe um, maybe that guest will be back. I forget who it was. But uh, tune in on Monday to see. But we, the thing about oil is you would think that lower oil would be good for the markets. But this gentleman had a very interesting point. 
he said that, well, you got a lot of highly leveraged oil companies out there, and as long as oil is very high, then they're making a lot of money and they could pay off their loans. But if oil begins to drop, let's say if oil goes to $30 a barrel, which, like they said at, on SNL the other night, at $30 a barrel, that's a good price just for the barrel. <laughs> um, anyway, if oil continues to drop, let's say it goes to $30 a barrel, well, you get this counterintuitive problem. You think, okay, all is good. Uh, uh, you know, we'll fill it up. We get uh, like fuel perks because we shop at uh, a certain store or whatever. And, and my wife saw it. We, we actually need to burn some gas in the car so we have enough to fill it up <laughs> because uh, we get like 20 gallons at $2 off. Well, gas is at like 185 and 175 depends on where you shop over here. So we're going to get 20 gallons. Of, we got 20 gallons of free gas coming to us. That's how cheap it is. So, all right, so let's multiply 20 times, let's just say, let's use a round number, 20 times, well, let's just $3. I remember when gas broke $3, everybody's excited. So 20 times 3 is what, 60 bucks? 20, 40, 60? So this week, when I go to get those fuel perks, I'm going to have 60 extra dollars. Well, maybe I'll take the little lady out. By the way, wives love it when you call them the little lady, so make sure you call your wife the little lady. So I'll take the little lady out. I got 60 bucks, you know. Well, we're not going to get a huge dinner for 60 bucks, but I got 60 bucks to, to spend, okay. So you would think that would be good for the economy, but it's always a complicated puzzle, and that's why you got to be really careful trying to put all those pieces together and instead just look at things and then take things one day at a time. Oil's going down, yes. Yeah. Stock's going sideways. Gold appears to be bottoming. And just look at each little market. Look at the whole thing. Think about some big picture scenarios, but don't try to figure it all out right away. Okay? All right, what other sectors? I think that's good on the sectors. Um, some of these real stronger areas like real, real estate are kind, of, are kind of following in that same, um, I don't want to say trap, but same kind of uh, following in the, in the footsteps of like the indices are going sideways. So it's mixed out there. Let me just show you the energies real quick. Recently, I said it looks like the energies are bottoming, but I didn't say that they had bottomed. And the reason was because they haven't bow tied yet. They just hit, made, this was like a pullback here. This was like return to lows, and then they came back up a little bit. So, okay, well, at least they're going sideways at that point. Last couple of days have imploded. Well, today and yesterday they imploded. So I think we're back to the process of bottoming and not a bottom. I'm still a bull on gold, okay? Gold's not going to be a route higher, unfortunately, for us. But it still looks pretty good overall. And if you put the bow ties in, we got a bow tie here off of major, major, major lows. Let's take a look at a weekly chart real quick. Okay. So go back to 2008. Before that, go back to 2002, 2003. So I hate to use the word value, but when you see a market get this low, making those roughly 10 year lows, thereabouts. It begins the bow tie. Maybe the the tide is beginning to turn. Ditto for the silver stocks. Okay, silver stocks have a little bit more overhead resistance to deal with than the gold, but there are a few interesting issues here if you do your homework and do a little digging with it. So I still think the golds have uh, potential in here. We're long sand, S A N D, not doing really well today. I'm guessing. Last time I looked at it, uh, but yeah, coming back a little bit. Uh, if you're not long gold, I like this. It's it's a little it's a little unorthodox as far as setups are concerned, but with the gold stocks, you have to be a little bit more lenient. But yeah, this one looks fantastic. So um, SLV sharp pullback to down. Okay, sharp pullback to down down sloping neckline inverse head and shoulders TKO in your world question mark. No, not a TKO. Um, a TKO is not part of a transitional pattern. Uh, in fact, this actually looks a little ugly in here, okay? So I'm just, I'm actually just seeing this because I was focused on the presentation. Um, and I, I, I do tend to shut down all feeds uh, before, just to give you bandwidth. And if not, I'm, I'm going to find myself watching the screen instead of lecturing. Uh, yeah, this is kind of ugly. So um, let's keep an eye on that situation. Uh, but you don't want this to, you don't want this to continue lower 
because then you'll be back in this space. So this is not a good development, Phil. Uh, I, I hear you on the head show. We talked about that. You brought that up many times on the show, and I think you, uh, you're, you're, I know you're good with, good with classical technical analysis. So, yeah, I fully agree with you on that. But we waited for the trigger in this case, which was the bow tie. But, yeah, that's, that's failing right now. I don't know what's going on with silver today. I don't. I don't look at the news, but every now and then I get a little through osmosis. And usually, like when I say, um, I don't know what's going on, somebody will chime in and tell me. <laughs> so that's how I get my news. V-U-Z-I. Gary is long. V-U-Z-I. Well, let's see what he's got here. Well, Gary, it looks like you're having a good day, uh, provided you got into that a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't know why I'm not getting a volatility reading on this one. Um yeah, it's kind of going a little nuts in here. Three, not not too crazy, but it's kind of getting a little squirrely in here. Getting a little nuts, a little squirrely. I see kind of a theme, don't you? <laughs> uh, I think I'd leave it alone for now, but if you're long, yeah, just try your stop higher. Congratulations. Okay, Phil wants to talk about pause. That's going to be a silver stock, and I bet it's going to get... Uh, I'll never forget that one because somebody once, I once recommended it, and it failed miserably, and they emailed me and said, I should have paused. I'm like, all right, thank you very much. P-A-A-S. Yeah, this one still looks pretty good. Um, I have to fully agree with you on this one. Now, again, keep in mind, but Dave, I thought you want perfect setups. Well, I do, but you got a double bottom. you got a bow tie. It's a silver stock, so you got to be a little lenient. So it was all over the place. But, yeah, that looks fantastic. I'd like to give you the first... High five of the day. That's fantastic. Looks like they're dropping like flies out there. Yeah, okay. All right. Martin wants to know about CAD, but he left. Should we talk about it? Let's just talk about Martin. Um, no, that's too thin. That can't be right. He's not here to ask, but so that's got to be a mistake. Uh, GG. GG's another one I'm going to like. Um, are any of these on the, on the Landry list? Don't... Phil, don't bring up any if they're already in the Landry list. But um, now GD has some bad memories up here. Okay, uh, Sand does too, but Sand's a much further away. GD's a little bit closer, and and this this is kind of cool because it, this. I'm glad you brought this one up because this is that resistance thing we were talking about earlier. But notice that it was broken. So once it gets broken, I'm not worried about it as much. I am still worried about this resistance though. So. From where you are now to there, that's four bucks. It's better to poke in the eye, but I think you can find, and it's going to be a little bit harder in gold because gold's kind of can be kind of choppy. But I think you can find something with maybe a little bit less overhead uh, supply. All right, John says BTX looks promising. Do you think the retracement out of the pullback is losing momentum or still a valid pullback candidate? Okay, that is uh, BTX. Let's take a look at that. Um, well, it's a little on the thin side, and this one is actually in um, in one of my momentum list, and it um, I did notice that it has lost some momentum. So you're right about that. Um, I think I would pass now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It's too many days in the pullback, but if you're long, stay long because it, it looks like it has it still has potential. But it, it's squirrely. I mean, it's pulled all the way back to its breakout. Uh, based on that metric, I would pass. Based on the fact it's kind of wide and loose, I would pass. The only reason it made it to the momentum list was it had broken out nicely and was hitting new highs in here. Jonathan wants to know about APRI. PRI, take a look at FXA. Uh, no, Jonathan, that's just, there's nothing there. It's kind of all over the place. Um, no, I don't, I don't see anything to be, and it's also thin and cheap. Uh, you know, when you add the cheapness of it with the thinness of it, that's really a speculative stock. And then look, look at this um, mountain of overhead supply. I guess that'd be a good problem to have. You bought it at 150, went to two, but no, take away, I, I avoid that. All right, Phil's on it. Phil says FXA dropped 2%. FSA, FXA, Australian dollar. Yeah, the Aussie dollar, look at that. Wow. And see, there's your next trade, okay? When this bow ties up, you want to buy it. Now, it's kind of thin, so you might want to look at the actual currency, okay? But keep an eye on that. When it bow ties up, 
it might be worth a shot. Thank you, Phil. Whenever I staff up, you will be on my staff. How's that? I like I like his passion for the markets. Uh, yeah, this looks good too. This is uh, I I'd be willing to bet it's on my minimum list. I haven't updated this list in three or four days. I've got some some work to do on it, but let's just see what's in it. Let's just see if it's there. Landry 100. Uh, C E M P. Yep, there it is, right there. See. I knew I recognized it. Now, it's not set up now. Let it break out to new highs and then look to play the next pullback. So you don't want to run out and do it. LEDs, yes, that's on my momentum list too. I'll show you that one right here. I know the stock. I know it well. Bam. Okay. But it's not set up now. But it made the list when it was banging out these new highs in here. So maybe on a pullback it might be worth a shot. All right, GLD. John was talking about GLD. The now, keep in mind, I, I prefer the underlying stocks versus the commodity itself. Uh, gold looks, still looks great to me. Silver looks dubious after today's action. Um, but gold still looks pretty good. you got a nice run from lows, just a bit of a pullback in here. With gold, it's not going to be a route higher or any commodity as a general statement. It's just going to be choppy. And that's why I gravitated away from commodities into stocks. I was a CTA for 14 years, okay, and then I just focused mostly on stocks. But, hey, pick your spots carefully, and there's occasions where commodities are worthwhile. And I still trade Forex, okay, but I pick my spots carefully, F-E-Y-E. F-E-Y-E -E is a bow tie to the upside with a series of higher lows since December 17th. What would you think about entering long if price takes out the most recent January 26 high? Uh no. I think I would let this stock I think I would let this stock um I think we talked about this one last week. Okay, this could be a Phoenix stock, but no, unless it gets up unless it takes out the top of this range, I am not interested in this stock. Okay. Just look at its behavior, look at its personality, okay? And wait for it to get out of that range before looking to take any action, okay? Yeah, I love GDXJ. In fact, GDXJ has been in my lander list for a while. And I even put some of these gold in this momentum list, too. There's GDX right there, okay? Doesn't look like much momentum, but it, in this case, I thought it was kind of like emerging momentum. Might be worth a shot. Uh, the GDXJ, GDXJ, uh, I think still looks great. Um, I've been telling my clients, if you want some exposure to the gold, GDXJ, even though I'm not a huge fan of ETFs, but look at your HV, 77. So this thing can move. Uh, wait for an entry now, though. You see, you may have dodged a bullet if you hadn't bought it yet. Uh, but, yeah, absolutely. You know, above this pivot high, that would be a great place to buy that. What if it keeps dropping? Well, don't buy it. Okay? If it doesn't go up, doesn't buy it. This is a Will Rogers trade, and this is a beautiful setup. And it would be beautiful in that if this thing decides it's just going to keep imploding, then so be it. Okay? If you get stopped out of a stock... So be it. We took a shot at Gold's a while back. I forget exactly when. I think it was back in January. And we made a little money on them, but not much. They came back in. And then we took another shot sometimes, or it seems like we took another shot, and they flat out didn't work. And now we're taking another shot. We get paid to take risks. We get paid to put capital in the harm's way. Okay? That's how, that's how it works, Beatrice. Okay, we're going to have to wrap things up pretty soon. Let's, let's get a couple more ASX for Richard. A lot of familiar faces here today. Uh, yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, a little bit, these a little bit more knockout moves. I don't think I don't like. I don't like the fact that it's just kind of approaching this power peak in here. I'd prefer, in fact, I'd prefer if it had cleared this peak and then pulled back. I think I would pass on it based on that. But, yeah, I hear you. If you would just look at this part here. A little bit more pullback, it looks pretty good. Maybe for a swing trade, but I would avoid it because you got the prior peak. I'd let it clear the prior peak and maybe look to trade it after it pulls back. APDN, emerging trend, APDN, I know this stock. Uh, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of squirrely, but yeah, it did uh, it did trigger uh, a setup in here. I think it triggered on this day here. It triggered like right in here. So technically, if you were trading that uh, with this pullback patterns, some of those IPO patterns, you, you'd be long this one, but it's kind of thin, 
super thin, super squirrely, so I'd be careful on that. But yeah, I agree. Could you DOU the implication of HV, please? Um, I don't know why my HV is not plotting here for some reason. Let's see something. Maybe something didn't get updated. Um, but you can see the S&P is 14. The, this is the 50-day HV, and it gives you a, a rough estimate of where a market is likely to trade. And it's a percentage. So this market, based on it's an annualized percentage, and it's like a two-thirds, there's a two-thirds statistical chance that this market will be 14% higher next year or 14% lower based on the action in the last 50 days. Now, keep in mind that's all things constant, and that's assuming a normal distribution. Those are two things that, that one, all things are not constant, and two, markets are not normally distributed. So that's HV in a nutshell. Okay. Well, let's go ahead. We probably need to wrap things up. I'm coming in on, uh, we're about 10 minutes away from two hours. I don't know how long the, the software will last. Um, I have a blast doing these, as you can tell. I'm flattered. I think we might have broke a record with the 10Ds today. So uh, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Um, anything un not covered uh, that you want answered, two things. One, email me, and I'll try to get back to you. Uh, I'll try to get answers as many within reason as I can. And if not, I'll let you know personally that we'll cover it in next week's webinar, just like we covered stops for the last hour or so. Uh, if we don't talk again between now and the weekend, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And um, I think that's it. All right. Uh, see you guys. Uh, don't forget tomorrow. See my website, Countdowns. Tomorrow, unusual activity. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Well, Financial Juice, which is also a usual, usual activity dot com financial juice at nine eastern uh monday at noon i'll be on uh one eastern i'll be on timing research and then obviously we'll do this next thursday and if anything else crops up in between if i could ask to go anywhere else i'll uh put it on the uh, website thanks again everyone and have a fantastic weekend